Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength. That I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language. But the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. In preaching the message of God's grace, there has been a lot of debates in the Christian faith and many a time inclining to the school of thought that we employ when we choose to employ whatever we employ sometimes because we trust the masters that teach us sometimes we allude to the schools we go to sometimes we incline to the understanding that we have and sometimes scripture is interpreted in very interesting ways and forms many a time. And so certain things in the word have failed to find bearing, even in the dispensation of the New Testament, more so when we realize that some of these things are spoken by men of grace, okay, in the Bible. Nobody can argue that Paul laid the foundation of the grace message, isn't it? He says, no other foundation shall any man lay, save that which is Jesus Christ. And he says, as a master builder, he calls himself a master builder. He says, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. Why does every man take heed on how he buildeth thereon? Because sometimes when we get into the space of building, Sometimes I see that we build this whole message sometimes without a certain completion. And if you're a reader of scripture, you will see that as Paul writes his letters, okay, his stone changes as it grows older, okay? And why does his stone change as it grows older? Because revelation is progressive, okay? Um, I believe that there are things that used to come in the spirit of Paul progressively, even as though there were things that were in the spirit of Paul by epignosis. Okay? There are things in the advanced and complete knowledge of God that were on his life, but also there are things I see that in the letters of Paul, if you are an ardent reader of Paul's letters, you see progression. You see him changing tones. For example, in the studying of his life, he makes very strong statements of himself, okay? And of his importance as a man of God, for no apostle matches me. Eh? I'm the best of the apostles, okay? And then in his later times of year, he calls himself the least of all, okay? That transition to see the man who called himself best get to himself as least, okay? It's an amazing experience. And what interests me is many people do not actually take time to study at what point do the names start changing in the life of Paul. And if you're reading the scripture, you realize that the names start changing in the life of Paul, even as something on his life is changing. How many of you know the meaning of Saul? The name Saul. Huh? Saul. Okay. And how many of you know the meaning of the name Paul? You'll see that those are opposites. And you see that there's a change on his life as God is dealing with him, okay? And so, when we are dealing with a ministry and space, the revelation of God's grace, I see that even in his writing, the writer becomes progressive. And... Uh, there are certain things that Paul has spoken that if for the past 500 years of Christian history or so, 
if we are to go back, okay, to discuss these words, you will see that many of us are ending back into the wars the grace message has gone through, which is Jacob Arsenius versus Calvin. Because there's some things that are Calvinistic that when we get in scripture they cannot be supported. And there are certain things that are Armenian that when we get in scripture they cannot be supported. So there is a huge debate on doctrine. Eh? And uh, there are things that Paul mentioned, like I said, that sometimes as great preachers, because we don't have the space for them, we don't mention. You understand what I'm saying? Least we fear that we might contradict ourselves with other scriptures in light with what Paul is trying to tell the church. Yet the word is not supposed to have contradiction. In fact, the word is not contradictory. If you read the word, you understand it. But now we are poised as we grow in this understanding to touch those complicated things, okay? When Paul makes a statement and says, therefore we ought to give the more honest heed, are you hearing me? To the things which we have heard, uh, least at any time we should let them sleep. And then he says, for if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received the just recompense of reward, he says, how shall we escape, he says, if we neglect so great salvation which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard it? Did you see that? Did you see that? And it's interesting that Paul writes these things so much in many churches he writes but mostly to the hebrews okay now he is saying if you read this scripture paul is speaking about believers he's not speaking about non-believers okay he's saying that how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation which at first began to be spoken of by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that had it. But when you read the verses before, right, he's saying we have to give more honest heed to the things we have had. Okay? Least at any time we should let them sleep. Okay? He's talking about people who are sitting in the convocation. He's talking to people who are available and have had these things. They have had them. Okay? They have had them. He's telling people who have retained something already, and he's telling them, don't let it slip away. You understand what I'm saying? He's not talking about people who have not obtained this. He's talking about people who already have something with them. Okay? And he warns us and says, we should not let these things slip away. How shall we escape if we neglect the salvation that was given us? You understand what I'm saying? But when Paul is saying we should not let these things slip, it's almost as though he's assuming that we can let certain things slip away from us. You understand what I'm saying? Which is not quite so much the way some people think or understand things. But Paul is saying it's possible to actually learn something and then you let it slip away. Yet you have given heed to it, right? Now he's telling us, give more honest heed to the things which we have heard. The things we have heard. At least we should let them slip away. And then he warns. Okay, he warns. That if the word that was spoken by the angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect this salvation given us? You understand? And was confirmed by them. And he continues to say, God also bearing witness with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. And when he goes down in verses 9, he says, but we see Jesus. Okay, who was made a little lower than the angels. And then he continues to explain all of this stuff. And we're like, okay, if he's warning, if a man of grace, a founder of grace, the man of the grace message is warning of a slipping away of things, what is he talking about? Okay, 
Then in Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12, we are from chapter 2. Now he goes in 3 and he says, Take heed, brethren, brethren, brothers of the same faith, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief, okay, in departing from the living God. You see, how can I, a new creation, have an evil heart? Is that possible? No. How can a new creation have unbelief? You understand? Yet I have believed on the Lord Jesus. You get where I'm coming from? And then he says, do not depart from the living God. Is there even a point of departing from the living God? How can I leave the God that I have received? If I'm a new creation born of the word of God and all this stuff, I believe, at what point does that new heart start to become evil-hearted? Is evil in the things that I do morally? Or is evil in the change of heart concerning my faith toward God? Because don't forget Paul has emphasized this. He says that that which is not done in faith is sin. You understand what I'm saying? Now, these are things we make as statements, but have we taken time to really ponder and think through these statements? Because the first time I started to bump on them years ago, they disturbed me concerning the doctrine that I know and I teach very well and I understand more than many of you. You understand what I'm saying? Now, he continues to say, but exhort one another daily while it is still called today, okay? Least any of you should be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Do you think Paul is talking about unbelievers here? Answer me. Do you think he's talking about unbelievers here? Because he's talking about an exhortation. He says, as long as it is today. But then he adds and says, least any of you should be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. You understand what I'm saying? And this is something we grace ministers don't touch. Because we don't know how to handle this. Again, our battle is still between Jacob and Arminius and Calvin. We cannot go beyond and say, maybe Calvin didn't see this clearly. Or maybe still Calvin saw this and he didn't have an explanation for it and probably skipped it and went to preach the things that he understands because he saw certain things contradictory and he didn't know where to place this. But yet it's still in scripture and it's looking at us straight in the eyes and asking us questions that we ought to have answers for concerning the faith. Praise God. He says in 14, for we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast and to the end. Verse 15 says, while it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart as in provocation. For some when they had did provoke, how be it not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, but with whom was he grieved for 40 years? He asked, was it not them which had sinned whose carcass fell in the wilderness? He's trying to say that it is possible for somebody to receive the word, hear it, and still turn themselves against it. Born again? Yes. It's possible for somebody to be born again and still set themselves against the course of the word. It's possible. And that's what he calls the hardening of the heart. It means, yes, I received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Okay? I'm born again. All right? But that's all I have believed. But there is more to this faith that we profess. You understand what I'm saying? There is more to this what? Faith that we profess. I'll give you an example, typical example. I've said this before. I said, for example, if the Bible says in the new creation that God is love, if a man does not walk in the love of God, that man does not know God. I'm just giving you an example. And somebody's born again. Truly they are born again. Okay? 
and then somebody hurts your feelings and breaks your heart. Okay? And then in your heart, you refuse to forgive them. I'm just giving you an example. In your heart, you refuse to forgive them. It doesn't mean that you're not born again. You are born again. But according to scripture, that's unbelief. You understand? Because firstly, you have forgotten what your nature is. That it is in your nature to walk in love. You understand? Whether you talk with them or not, because there are people you can forgive, but you'll never have the opportunity to even tell them I forgive you. Okay? It happens. But forgiveness is a heart issue. Isn't it? So how can you be born again and know that you have to walk in forgiveness and refuse to forgive? That's the hardening of the what? Of the heart. Now there's somebody whose heart is struggling. I'm not talking about the person who says, you know God, I feel like I'm dealing with unforgiveness. Help me forgive. Grant me the full understanding of this thing because I want to. Okay? If somebody says, I want to, that's somebody who has understood that it's my nature to walk in forgiveness. I'm struggling to forgive, but I want to. You understand what I'm saying? That is not the kind of person we're talking about. We're talking about the kind of person who doesn't even want to. And then you ask me, but is it possible for a Christian not to want to? And that's where now we start to say, no, according to scripture, how can a new creation refuse because it's born of an incorruptible seed. Yes, it is born of an incorruptible seed. And therefore, it's not supposed to set itself against such things. But I have been around people who have refused. And so sometimes we're starting to ask harder questions. And the harder questions are, are some individuals really born again? Are you hearing what I'm saying? Are some individuals really born again? Because how can they have the spirit and still set themselves against the way of the spirit? You understand what I'm saying? How can you be born again and refuse to forgive? How? You understand what I'm saying? So, for the preacher, you get worried. Why? Because... Sometimes you want to enter this individual who has been in the faith for all these years and you know they speak in tongues and all this and you're like, but what about these tongues? What about this fasting? What about all this prayer? What about all of this? What about all of these things we see? You understand what I'm saying? Again, the questioning is not on what they do, but the questioning is on the heart that cannot see, that they carry a nature that has to play out a certain way because they carry that nature. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, when Paul is mentioning these things, but then he sounds like he's talking to believers, I get worried. Because it's almost as though he saw these things. He experienced these things in the congregation. But like I said, our doctrine of grace has not given space to explain or even touch these things. Again, these are things I warn you, if you've had grace preachers, they don't teach these things. They don't touch them. They teach everything except these things I'm talking about. And I know that I stand to sound contradictory, but apostasy is real. To follow from the faith He's real. When Paul is speaking to Timothy, his son, right? In 1 Timothy 1.19, he tells him, hold faith and a good conscience. And he says, which some? He gives examples. Put away concerning the faith and have made shipwreck. These were believers. And then he gives an example down there and he says, of whom is he, Manias and Alexander, who I have delivered unto Satan that they may not learn to blaspheme. These guys got to a level of blasphemy, yet they had believed. Paul is not saying they were not believers. I want you to understand this. Paul is not saying that Hamanias and Alexander were not believers. But at what point did Alexander 
and Hymenaeus get to a point of blasphemy that an apostolic voice had to turn them over to Satan that they might learn not to blaspheme yet their faith was existent at one particular point and now it has made shipwreck do we actually see that this has happened in scripture do you want to tell me that Alexandria and Hymenaeus were not believers Huh? Come on, tell me, answer me. Do you want to tell me that Alexandria and Hymenaeus were not believers? They were believers. But how have we gotten to a point where a believer, someone who received the Holy Spirit, received Jesus as their Lord and Savior, embraced the message. At one particular point now, we are discussing that their faith has made shipwreck. You know what shipwreck means? In other words, their faith has been destroyed. And because their faith has been destroyed, the conscience has been compromised and corrupted. And because the conscience has been compromised and corrupted, now they are teaching different doctrines. Folk that once held a faith. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, for me to read that and realize that it can actually happen, or it has actually happened in the time of Paul, I have questions concerning the preconceived doctrine that I have preached for years, that was revealed to me for years, that I understand for years. But when somebody asks me this part of scripture, many, again I repeat, many faith, grace, present truth ministers are not talking about these things. And we are losing people like that, and we're still not talking about these things, because we don't know how to address them without bruising Calvin or Jacob. Do you understand what I'm saying? For example, if you come from Africa, 90 or 80% of the doctrines we have were imported. Okay? If you go church history, 26, 27, 30th, 40th, you're dealing with church missionary society, you're dealing with Protestantism, you're dealing with Lutheran doctrine, you transition through the Wempe movement, and then after the Wempe movement, 70 or 80% of the doctrines that start coming in are coming in from the United States. And if you're talking about the United States, you're talking Calvin Jacob because the debate is around that. You understand? So even the standard of those that teach us is either Calvinistic or Jacobasaminian. Are all the things Calvin says wrong or out of context? I agree with Calvin a huge lot. Are all the things Jacobus speaks out of context? I agree with Jacobasaminian in certain thoughts. But now I have a problem. When I start to see that there are things that Calvin and Jacob are not touching, but they are a reality because they don't place for us where Hymenaeus and Alexander are. How can the same oracle of grace, how can Paul, a grace preacher, a grace preacher, hand such men over to Satan that they may not to not blaspheme? Oh, Apostle Grace, I think I understand more grace than Paul. Why didn't Paul pray for the salvation of the apostates? Because these are people Paul could have prayed for if he's a man of faith. Eh? Hush. Hush. Sirika, you don't know what you are talking about. To judge Paul means you judge our foundation. Don't be so quick to judge him. Because everything you're quoting, you got it from him. Imagine you had a Bible without Paul. Imagine how the church would look like. Just imagine the church of Jesus Christ without Paul's letter. Just think about it. Think what would happen to our marriages. Think the criterion we would use to get married if Paul didn't tell us. Think of the criterion of giving in the church if Paul didn't teach it. Think of the place of faith if Paul didn't teach it. Think of the law and grace. The doctrine is these letters of Paul were not there and Jesus had died and then Peter gives his lot of story and then, you know, James writes his lot of story and then we collect it together and say this is the manuscript of the New Testament. You understand what I'm saying? That is why newer faiths are now getting rid of Paul. Because now, Paul also does not quite fit in the doctrine some men are teaching in this dispensation and we also call it grace and i'm warning people and i said look 
much as we are preaching the grace, we must not forget that that same Bible we open to quote, we canonized it and say that this is foundational. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because now we see extremes of people who preach grace to the level where even Paul can't understand them. And we have to either make them our teachers or Paul. Do you understand? But me, I'm sort of like the old school which would rather stick on the foundation of Paul and build on it because I don't know where their building is going. But I'm sure something has preserved Paul's message to now. I would rather go on that and insist on that particular one. But for the man who gave us grace to be able to hand over somebody to Satan, we have questions. Why? Why? Patience. Couldn't you be patient with them? Doesn't God love them? He wills that no man perish. Who will have all men what? to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So if we have that, then why are you handing over that Alexander and Himenaeus? And you see, he's trying to build something. When it comes to Hebrews 6, verse 4, okay, if you go to many commentaries, when they read Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4, many again interpret that according to either a Calvinistic school of thought or an Arminian. But they don't really go deep to understand what is Paul trying to tell us here. Now, that is why it's very hard to hear this verse spoken of in church, more so if you're a grace preacher. But it's in the Bible and we're stuck with it. So I've got to go there. Praise God. Now, Paul says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tested of the heavenly gift, have tested of the heavenly gift, you hear that? They have tested of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. Now, when we talk about testing, we can say they tested but they didn't eat the bread. They tested but they didn't eat the bread. And I have myself said that. Okay? You, you get where I'm coming from? Because they have they tested, they tested. He, but when the Bible says, for Christ has tested death once, didn't he really die? <laughs> now I'm confused. You get my point? Eh? I had to go back eh, and first rub some Calvin out and say, what does this scripture really say? Because when the Bible says, Christ has tested death once for all men, again, the same word there for testing is the very word here for testing. And when we talk about the same testing, the other side, the man really died. So it wasn't a sample. Now, as I ground starting to think, this word here for tested, the heavenly gift, actually is not just testing. I corrected myself years ago. But how was I to give it the language to be understood? Because now, again, like I said, our generation has to transcend beyond what is being taught and really still go back to the scripture. To get to get it. And me, when I say, okay, this one, I was reading it from a certain eye, now I'm ready to see it from the right eye, it's imperative that I also give you the way I see it, okay? Because we would have been okay if they were just heavenly gifted, but the Bible says they were made partakers of the Holy Spirit. That means these are people who receive the Holy Spirit. Huh? They were enlightened, right? And the Bible says, and they have tested the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. He said, if they shall fall away to renew them again and to repentance, seeing that they crucify themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. This is not quite the understanding we have when we touch grace. How can a new creation fall away? And how can with this God of whom all things are possible, put a clause and say it is impossible for them to come again to repentance? And the Spirit told me this is because 
we read that as it is impossible to renew them again to forgiveness. You see, we confuse many times when we see that word repentance, we so much put it on the side of what God should do for them than what actually they have to do for themselves. So here, we're not talking about God's grace. We're not saying that God's grace towards them is dead or that it has ceased. We're not talking about his heart declined from them or his mercy and grace bestowed on them. Here, we're talking about them if they fall away, to renew them again and to repentance. These particular individuals, to change their mind. It does not mean that if they set themselves, you know, against God, therefore so God is going to go to their level and try to think like them. You understand what I'm saying? In fact, let's continue and say, for the earth, which drinketh in the rain that cometh of it, and bringeth forth herbs, meat for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth the blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and barriers is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. Now, these are very strong statements, because the burning is talking about here, or nigh unto curse. They're near, they're next to being cursed. He's not talking about the burning of hell. You understand what I'm saying? He says, but beloved, in verses 9 he encourages, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, and that's we that speak. He's telling this guy, he's saying, uh-uh, we don't think that for you you've gone that far. And now some interpret that to say he wasn't talking to the Christian. You see? Because again, when you understand Calvin, how can a Christian refuse to repent. You understand what I'm saying? How can a Christian fall away from God and just fall away? It's not possible. He's the author and the finish of my faith. So if I fail, who is responsible? Is it his will at work in me or is it uh, my will? So that's the battle between Jacobus and Calvin. Is human will involved in this or is it entirely the will of God and we just yielded it? So into it, you understand what I'm saying? Again, it creates harder questions. But these people, one, were enlightened. Two, tested of the heavenly gift. Three, were made partakers of the Holy Spirit. Four, they tested the good word. But Paul is telling us it is possible for them to slip away. It is possible. Yes, it is. But they are a new creation. They have an incorruptible heart. How come it? Okay. I also don't know, but it is possible. We lost Alexandria and Jimenez. And we've lost people. The church of Jesus Christ has lost people. Ministries across the world don't know how to deal with such people. Now, Paul is also telling us it is hard to renew them again to repentance. In other words, it is impossible for such people to see certain things. In my years of faith, I have observed certain things and believe that certain people will never change. You might not believe it now, but give it time, you'll see that certain people will never change. Does God want them to change? Yes. Is this grace still available for them? In their foolishness, yes. His love and mercy is still there. You get it? But I believe that his power on their lives is short-circuited. Because this they do to themselves. You understand what I'm saying? And he's saying, why? What is this number one thing of sleeping away? Paul still emphasizes the issue of faith, belief, belief. It's possible for someone to believe something and over the years start losing that faith. It's possible. There's a preacher we know very well, some of us, I'm not going to mention his name, but he was an international fellow, he was a healing evangelist. 
This guy used to heal. He used to heal. Tumors used to fall off in his meetings. Are you hearing me? He used to cast out devils and devils would scream. He used to do all kinds of things and people would sleep and healings would take place. Incurable, blind eyes were brought in his meetings before he even spoke the eyes would see. And this guy one time woke up and denounced and went back to Roman Catholicism. The world didn't know how to respond to it. Some ministers said, no, he wasn't born again, he didn't believe, if he had believed, he would not fall away. But the chap had an anointing. That many who think, understand the doctrine, couldn't even match a fraction of the anointing that was working on his life. But we lost an evangelist into the Roman Catholic Church, and from then on, the Church of Jesus didn't know how to react to that. We let him go. Some of you woke up to a very sad news recently of a young man who was singing in Hillsong. And he wrote the next day one day and opened the open article. He doesn't believe in divine what? Healing. He doesn't believe that Jesus heals. He started even questioning the existence of God. But he wrote him on this God. And you'd be so funny to think, ah, that one never received Jesus, really. Yes, even us, we're asking, were they born again? Okay, if they were not born again, but we saw the evidence of the gifts of the Spirit on them. So how then was the evidence of the gift of the Spirit on them if they were not born again? You understand what I'm saying? I believe that a minister, a believer, can fall off the faith. But on the other hand, I still think that God's grace is still toward them. You understand? Because they believed. So I don't doubt that they can have heaven. I don't doubt that. I don't doubt that if they have believed, even in their madness, still there's a restoration somewhere that God will grant them heaven. But I believe that that action sort of kills something in them. And they will never function fully like they have to. How many of you understand what I'm saying? Now, in 1 Samuel 15, verses 22, Samuel said, he brings something out, okay? Samuel tries to introduce the church to a sort of witchcraft. And again, because some of us think witchcraft differently, all right? Then he says, and Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight, okay, in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Is the Lord more interested in sacrifices and offerings than obeying his voice, he says. And he continues, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. Okay? And he says, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as idolatry, and Taramin, the household good luck images, because you've rejected the word of the Lord. He has also rejected you from being king. Now he's speaking to the king, but let's leave the king issue here. Let's now touch these two things. God is trying to bring in our idea. He's speaking about rebellion, okay? And he's speaking about stubbornness. And he says that when you see someone who is rebellious, he says that to be rebellious is actually witchcraft. You get it? And then he says, to be stubborn is actually idolatry. You get it? Now, let's discuss stubborn. Because some believers are stubborn. You get it? Some believers are stubborn. You understand? God has said A, B, C, and they know it, and they still set themselves against that. You get it? Some believers in the church are rebellious. Okay? Now, if you are rebellious, it means you are working under some sort of witchcraft. 
Get into Paul's brain and understand. He goes to the Galatians. He says, you foolish Galatians. Who bewitched you? He's talking about witchcraft now. Because there's a sort of witchcraft in the body of Christ. That one, we don't know how to address it because it's not done by sorcerers and talisman. It's not done by people who smoke pipes and put back clothes. That one is not on people who throw things down and dress a certain way and sacrifice animals and sit in small hats. This one now, it's a kind of witchcraft that is happening in the body of Christ, okay? And it is happening on believers, by believers, and through some believers, and we don't know how to deal with it. We can't call it witchcraft because we don't understand that it's witchcraft. But this in its own sense is witchcraft. Let me give you an example. Did you know to speak evil on someone is witchcraft, biblically? To wake up and speak evil about someone, you are actually performing witchcraft, scripturally. Because you're pronouncing a curse on somebody, anathema. You are either by gossip, slander, cheap talk, or all these things. You are speaking evil and trying to destroy the destiny of another man. What is that called? That is witchcraft. And some people run on these ones who do witchcraft in the world, but they don't understand that that is more dangerous. Yours is more dangerous. Why? Because you have the gift of the Spirit of God in you. In there, you have hardened your heart. And stiffen your neck to refuse to know and say, if I'm a believer, I don't speak certain things about people. My wife is my witness. In my house, we don't discuss people. We don't speak negative about people in my house. She knows it. Do I start speaking a conversation about someone and speak evil of them? I don't do it. I don't do it. My pastor, no, they have never had me speak evil of someone. And I have reason. You understand what I'm saying? Because it's witchcraft. It's witchcraft. Now we don't know how to deal with that. So he says, no, Galatians, somebody bewitched you. Because you began in faith, you began in grace, and now you're seeking to be justified under the law. At what point did the Galatians, which were under grace, submitted to grace, yielded to grace, at what point did their antenna start changing to start receiving a different frequency? That now Paul has to come back to tell them to say, you know, let me correct you here. Witchcraft had taken place. Somebody bewitched them. It began with a seed that was planted inside them and it was allowed to germinate. It was allowed to germinate. Now, why does Paul say that it is impossible to bring them to repentance? Because this is why, and I asked the Lord for so many times that until he gave me the answer. I said, because there is a place in me, God said, when a man has tested it, when a man has seen it, and they fall from it, there is nothing about me that will ever come to them and stir passion again in them. It's like when you give your best, okay, in a relationship, and your partner gets to a point where even your best will never work for them, there is nothing you can do beyond that. Do you understand? Because every time God diffuses something in us, every time he puts something in us, he says, this one will move them. This one will move them. This one will move them. This one will amaze him. This one will catch his attention here. This one will direct them here. And somebody receives it. Okay? And if they refuse that, God has the right to say, you know, let me add this. But there comes a point where somebody has seen enough that if they reach that level and they have not seen yet, nothing big will ever move them. Nothing big will ever move them. Because God knows what should move us. You understand? 
And that is why I agree with Jacob Arseminian that God will never go beyond your will. The Spirit of God is gentle. If a man sets themselves against him, he will not strive with man forever. It's not the kind of spirit to impose a man against his will because he wants to impose his sovereignty. No, because then the relationship is not love, they are robots. You have built robots. You understand what I'm saying? Now that's why Paul is saying, pray for yourselves that you don't slip away. Be very careful. Make prayers to God and say, God, I pray that I continue seeing you as you must be. And that the smallest things that catch my wonder in you stay catching your wonder in you. And sometimes you can sit and see someone and what used to excite them doesn't excite them anymore. And because you've seen them around church for so many years, you assume they know what you're saying. They've heard it over and over. But not all are like that. Some have slipped away from it. The things that used to catch them, they no longer catch them anymore. I've seen believers who start to look like they know but over the years you start to see that they actually never understood the message. And for some, you don't know how far they have gone as of whether they are still at a point where God can still amaze them or they are past any amazement the gospel will ever give them. That is why the wise and prudent are hidden from these things and the babe receives them. That is why. Because some people's hearts have still stayed humble and open to God to be amazed. And some wise and prudent ones have gotten to the level where they know it all. There is nothing new that they are going to listen that will move them. I've heard it or I've seen that. Mm, yeah, yeah. Mm, okay. Mm, you understand? You even tell someone to pray and they just start observing everyone pray. I've seen it. An instruction from the altar said pray. And somebody looks like this. And then they even go on their phone. I've seen it. I'm like, you know, but you don't know whether they are at that point where they will be, where they can be still, or they are beyond it. Only God knows. We can't judge that. Are you hearing me? You know when I just got and born again for said, ah, ah, that's fire, it will come down. More time. Over the years, the fire has increased. Because I'll tell you why. I still wonder at Genesis 1, like I first read it the first day. The word of God has never ceased to amaze me. Every time I open it, I see it afresh. Because it's an attitude that I must build in my spirit. Because if I lose that, one day words will be spoken and my eye will be blind to see. Because my heart has been hardened on what I assume I understand I have not understood yet. Today, even as a pastor, there are people I can't even call and tell that this you've done wrong. Because I feel that their heart is hardening away from what is obvious. You understand what I'm saying? That you can even tell a believer that this is wrong and they won't say sorry. Because in their head, something in them is dying that should give them godly sorrow over even what's obvious. With that one, even the voice of counsel is hard. That's why I realize God is quiet to certain people. Because he has given you the word and certain things are obvious. And it's like, but what more do I need to add when you know but this is the right thing. What will Apostle Grace add? I cannot add anything. So I just watch and pray. You understand what I'm saying? I don't know whether I can hand over someone over to Saturn. I've not reached that level. 
But you understand what I'm saying? We would judge Paul and say, ah, but Paul, you taught love. Bambi. <laughs> so you think you understand love more than Paul? Or the God who walked to Moses and told him, let me kill these people, I'll get you out. And Moses says, uh uh, no. And what happened? He died of malaria. And the biggest percentage still died in the wilderness. They never crossed. The adult population that was diseased, God didn't kill them. But because of what they had set in themselves, it still destroyed them. Even when he had honored Moses not to kill them. It means that their own ways killed them. Even when God didn't. You understand? So, what I'm trying to tell you here is that be very careful to examine yourself whether the things of God still cause a wonder in you. Whether the word of God that comes to you every week really is working in you. Whether it really has effect in your life. Do you know that some people come in this ministry two, three, four, five months and they have understood the message. And then some can sit for three, four, five years and they've not understood it. You can tell. You understand what I'm saying? And then you see, on the excited of five months, they make one year, two years, three years and realize they understood it. And the other one is in the sixth year. And you observe they don't understand it. You get it, but you don't know where they are. So you just keep on preaching the gospel and let God do his own business because we're not called to change men. But it hurts you. When as Paul said in his words that in the time when you ought to be teachers, in the time when you ought to be teachers, he says, you have need that one teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And he says that even though someone has been in the gospel for five, six years, there are people, I honestly, if I have opportunity, I would still take back to me and still take them back. But I don't know where they are, so I don't know where to begin from. So I just pray. But there are people I look at and I feel maybe I needed to tell them again the first principles of the oracles of God and reteach them. Because it's almost as though even though they have the speech, the language is still of a babe. The actions are still of a babe. Some of us have refused to mature. We've refused to mature. You understand? We've refused to mature. So, my prayer for you and for myself is that may God help us stay connected to Him. You understand what I'm saying? May God help us stay connected to Him. I have been in this movement for five years now. And you are my witnesses that movements have come and gone in these five years before our very own eyes. Before our very own eyes. Lose anything but never lose the wonder. Never lose the feeling the Spirit makes you feel. Never lose the things that the Word puts in you. Never lose everything, but not that. If you ever wake up in the morning and the thing that moved you doesn't move you again, worry if what moved you before was truth. Pray for yourself. Because chances are that maybe you disconnected long ago and you don't know. Because it's possible for a man to be disconnected and not know. Unless certain things are expressed. Again, this is not a message for those who are in the class of the impossible. No. This is a message for those who still have something within them. I'm trying to strengthen that which remaineth. If the knees are still standing but they are feeble, this message can help straighten them. But again, I'm saying this message is not going to change certain people. But it is a warning 
for some of you who could slip away without knowing that you are without knowing that you are when I started the faith when we went to meetings there were people who are on every meeting you understand and there are people who have stayed in every meeting but there are also people I noticed over the years something started to something killed it you understand what I'm saying eh? now I'm not saying that everyone who is at the meeting understands get me right right I'm not saying that everyone who attends my every meeting understands me better than that one who didn't come last week again I'm not judging who came and who didn't come but as a man of God I observed that there were certain people who I am sure are busy but they are trying their level best for some live stream some may fail but there are also some I know who disconnected they didn't leave the church but they disconnected I can tell that the things that used to stir them to hunger no longer stir them to hunger anymore and I wish they found something higher but they haven't and chances are that they never even understood this you get it eh? so what was the labor for what were those years of seeking God for and some they sought God he appeared and blessed them and they disconnected you understand someone in those days when there was no money in their houses what they didn't have food you know, in the presence when the jobs came the money came now they are busy eh now you soon removed you understand what I'm saying? And there are men who are richer than you and they still seek God. Because they are dead to money. Again, mark me. I'm not saying everybody who doesn't attend is wrong. That is for them to examine themselves with the Lord. But they are some I know. And I observe and I worry for them. Because in my university days we sought God with many people and I don't remember one person in our circles who sought God and was not blessed I remember men we used to go down on the knees with in nights of prayer and the rain would hit us until morning I remembered people we used to fast for days and months for and we went many days without food and I see these people now and many of them slowly by slowly by slowly I saw them disconnect they're still born again they can still preach the gospel some can demonstrate some the demonstration died but their effect died but they got jobs immediately got married built houses cars work they have things but some come to me now and you see that they are looking to awaken something and they don't know how to awaken it again and even me I don't know where they are at because I don't know whether God still says there's something in them that can awaken again there is glory in God reviving the apostate but I've seen that in certain places God prefers not to revive certain apostasies why because they have tested enough if that's what he tells them he tells them look if the works that were done in you were done in Sodom and Gomorrah he said till now it would have remained until this day God is trying to say look some people if they had what you had they would not be destroyed but you have it and still go down the way of destruction And for some of you it is so available there is too much we've preached you understand what I'm saying I've preached thousands if you listen to one every day you take at least four to five years to finish what I've already preached in this life already you understand what I'm saying and those are hours of material and those are experiences of people who wept, fall under power, rolled. The same person who rolled under that same anointing stands up and says something, and you're like, 
yet you fell under this hand you fell under this hand and can stand up and say such a word you understand what I'm saying to a man of God some of you all you know is what we gave you you didn't know God <laughs> you did not know God don't think you know him better now you understand what I'm saying what makes us think that the grace message is for us to give excuse for our fishes in the things of the spirit? Something is dying. You get it? So that's a warning. Now I speak as an apostle. Speak to God. that you've given us today we thank you and we receive it with joy because we feel your love in the words that have been spoken we pray for us God help us help us Lord my only prayer is that you will help us 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 just help us you know how to help us help us help us Help us, God, help us. Help us is our prayer. Is all I can say, help us. In Jesus' name. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Sonero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at Fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.